Um, I'm really happy to, um, to, to welcome all of you here and our panelists as well. Um, my name is Ami Bishop. I'm Outright's uh, Senior Research Advisor and previously also served on, on Outright's board for nine years. Um, I'm going to be your host and, your, and the moderator for the discussion. So as I said, if you're just signing in, please introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to know who's, who's out there listening to us. Um, also, once we get going, um, please go ahead and enter any questions that you might have in, in the Q&A function or in the, in the chat, whichever, we'll be checking both. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so today, I'm really happy um, to be able to, to join with my colleagues and um, discuss the findings of a recent report uh, that we and our partners uh, just released a few weeks ago um, that looks at website censorship of LGBTI related um, websites in six, in six countries. So this research was conducted in close partnership with the Open Observatory for Network Interference, also known as UNI, um, represented today by Maria. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Maria, briefly? Sure, thank you, Ami, um, and thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Maria Zainer. I work with the Open Observatory of Network Interference, commonly known as UNI, as mentioned. And uh, we're a free software project uh, building tools for detecting the blocking of websites and apps, uh, including the blocking of LGBTIQ websites around the world. And we had the opportunity to collaborate with Outright Action International and the Citizen Lab on this research report. And I'll be available uh, during the Q&A if you have any questions, particularly regarding the technical findings of the report. Thank you, Maria. And then our other key partner, of course, was Citizen Lab. Um, which is based at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And Irene uh, Poetronto is here. So Irene, you wanna say a few words? Hi, uh, good morning everyone from Toronto, Canada. And thank you, Ami, for organizing this panel and for saying our organization name, which is quite a mouthful. Um, <laughs> as Ami said, uh, I'm with the Citizen Lab. We are a cybersecurity and human rights research lab uh, based at the University of Toronto. And I'm one of the report's uh, co-authors and I will be uh, happy to answer any questions that you have during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, so the, today, the heart of the discussion, though, is really going to focus on the impact of website censorship on movements in the countries that we focused on. So I'm really, really honored to welcome our three panelists, um, and we'll ask them now to introduce themselves. Um, Khalid, would you like to go first? Yes, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Khaled Abdelhadi. I am from Jordan. Uh, I am the editor in chief and the founder of uh, online uh, MENA regional publication, MyCali. Uh, it's an online publication, basically. It's an online conceptual uh, platform that discusses issues on gender, sexuality, body orientation, identity, and LGBT, queer feminist intersectional issues for the Middle East, from the Middle East, North Africa. Uh, and we highly work with storytelling, documentation, uh, and the power of art into reflecting the stories of the queer and the feminist community in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khaled. Welcome. So glad you could be with us. Um, uh, Michal, Misha, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And um, Misha Tomasov, and I'm, I'm an LGBTIQ uh, activist from Russia. I'm a co-founder of the regional LGBT organization in Samara City, and I'm a former um, chairperson of Russian LGBT network, still a member of it. Thank you, Misha, welcome. So, so glad you're with us. And then last but not least, uh, Lini, would you like to go? Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I have some trouble with my audio, but I hope you all can hear me clearly now. Uh, my name is Lini Julia. You can just call me Lini. I go by C. Um, and I'm with the uh, ASEAN Surgical Coast as advocacy uh, officer. ASEAN Surgical Coast is the regional network of queer human rights defender and advocates in Southeast Asian region. Um, and we work, our mandate is to advocate um, the soji rights um, in the regional and national level here in Southeast Asian region using the ASEAN human rights mechanism as an approach. 
thank you outright uh, for having me here and i was also part of the um, research um, uh, for indonesia of course uh, country specific thanks i mean thank you thank you lini lini your audio is a little fuzzy but i think hopefully everyone can can understand it i don't know if there's anything to do to clarify it a little bit um just a little bit muffled but uh, if not, we'll we'll do our best. So, um, so I'll try my best to. <laughs> okay, okay. So, thank you so much to, to all of you for joining. Um, before we start the conversation with the panelists, I'm just going to review very quickly some of the the basic findings um, on behalf of our our, our partnership, um, and then we'll turn to um, turn to the panelists for for, for further discussion. So. Great, will you see a slide? Can you make that a bit bigger? Let's see. Can, can people see that it's a little bit small on my screen? Um, okay, great. Um, so first of all, let me just say why we chose to focus on this area. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear to everyone here that access to information, the ability to connect virtually um, not to, and physically, of course, can potentially support and empower communities, advance human rights organizing, and, and, and even save lives in, in regions where connecting physically can, can pose risks um, in certain conditions. Um, so for marginalized populations, including queer people, online spaces are especially critical for safely identifying information, resources, connecting to others in their community, engaging in human rights advocacy and movement, movement building. So really the ability to connect and communicate virtually is increasingly a lifeline for many LGBTI um, people around the world. So um, I, we, we already talked about the partners, which um, we were very, very happy to, to collaborate with. Uh, the objectives uh, were to, um, investigate how website censorship impacts local LGBT communities uh, and their movements in six countries. And these countries were Indo the Indonesia, Malaysia, Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Um, and then we also wanted to document which uh, LGBTIQ related websites are being blocked in the six countries and also how, and that was um, the work that UNI in, in particular was able to look at. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the methods um, of censorship, uh, these are the findings and, and we, I'll just go through them quickly. And so the first is really, you know, the methods of censorship are fairly transparent, which is, which is um, you know, helpful to some degree. So, so the issuing of block pages when, when an, a website is blocked, such as the one that's on the slide there. Um, the other thing is that even, although censorship didn't always correlate with, say, criminalization of same-sex relations, it did correlate with hostile legal and religious environments. And this perhaps is sort of stating the obvious, but among the countries that we were looking at um, for criminalized same-sex relations, um, and then um, they also, or in the case of Russia, while it may not be criminalized, they have other kinds of restrictive laws on gay propaganda, or um, pornography or kind of trying to uphold traditional values. Um, the, the other thing that we saw was um, where in, in, in Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Indonesia, part, uh, parts of Indonesia, the, the move towards trying to apply Sharia law um, and, um, and the implications then for, for uh, access to information and ability to communicate about LGBTIQ issues. Um, kind of related to this, what we also found was that in some settings um, that uh, queer content is often equated with pornography and therefore subjected to the, um, to the laws or subject to the laws that outlaw such content. Next slide, please. We also noted that, that blocking patterns varied. So for example, in Malaysia and Indonesia, only international sites um, were, were being blocked, whereas there was no distinction between national, regional, and international and the other sites. Um, the highest consistency of blocking 
was found in Saudi Arabia, where most of the the LGBT websites uh, or websites that had LGBTI content were found blocked more than 75% of the times tested. So that's about consistency. Uh, in terms of the, the number of URLs being blocked, um, uh, 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 I think it was uh, Iran. I think there's a little problem in, oh no, there it is. Iran was, um, uh, was highest with 75 and the United Arab Emirates was next with 51 blocked uh, URLs. So here's a, uh, the next point um, I hope we might be able to dig into a little bit more in the discussion. And that is that, that government efforts to block access to online content often require really the complicity of private sector actors. So um, whether it's um, corporations or companies that, that provide uh, technology to filter, to block, or it's other, um, for example, companies like Apple or Google who are blocking apps um, for access uh, to, to uh, supportive information. Um, that this is something that I think is um, an important point, uh, something that Citizen Lab also has touched on in its previous work. Um, although we didn't look specifically at online entrapment and other ways of, of, of well, the ways in which um, online interaction can pose danger to activists in particular and queer people more generally. We did see through the research that pervasive risk of online entrapment was, was um, uh, present in Iran, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. And then, you know, underlying all of this um, is the fact that be because of these very, um, uh, restrictive uh, and, and, some, and sometimes uncertain environments about what will be blocked and what won't be blocked and what, what will uh, incur some sort of um, punitive response. Self-censorship is very common. Um, and, and so this in itself has real implications for how activists can, can function and communicate um, and, and also uh, just members of the community. So, um, Certainly what we found is that activists need support continually to continually educate themselves on safety and circumvention um, because it's really a game of leapfrog frog where, where uh, you know, we as communities try to circumvent when we're being blocked and then you know, governments and those doing the blocking try to um, plug the holes and we find the holes again. So it's, it's, um, it's an ongoing struggle. Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into all of these recommendations. You can look at them in the report, which um, I think we, we have posted or will post in the chat, a link to the report. But um, you know, essentially uh, the, the, the main point in terms of, for example, UN agencies, international NGOs and donor partners is that local movements need support um, to, to, to uh, ensure that they're able to um, implement sound safety and security measures online and that they have the technical capacity to continue with their work despite the, the, the barriers being put forth by um, governments. So that, that is a huge um, piece is, is the resourcing of, um, of movements and organizations. And I think also, of course, um, we, we heard from activists themselves that um, they, they wish to document and publicize censorship to really demonstrate how it directly violates international standards. And so having, um, having that support and backing to, to do that effectively is important. Um, I touched on the private sector issues. Um, I, I think, you know, really corporations, whether they are knowingly entering into um, harmful practices with governments, I assume I'm not naive that they, they must know, but they really need to um, assess and limit their impact um, of their technologies on human rights defenders. Um, there, there are international frameworks such as the guiding principles on business and human rights um, that, that the companies are supposed to abide by. So um, I think this, this whole area is, is really important. Uh, next slide. 
And then finally, um, just again, emphasizing um, the importance of safety and security um, and, um, and, and standardizing, you know, building in funding for um, addressing uh, safety, security and options and tools for, for um, circumventing censorship from protecting themselves um, from, from uh, essentially, you know, cyber, uh, blocking and and worse. Um, so I'm going to stop there. All of these are more uh, presented much more in detail in our report, which people are um, free to look at. So I, I want to turn now, really, to the again to the heart of heart of the matter, which is how uh, censorship is impacting um, activists and and communities on the ground. Um, and so. Um, Khalid, I'm going to uh, start with you, if that's okay. Um, you're the the founder, as you you described, an editor of, of a pan Arab online magazine aimed at audi audiences in the Middle East and North Africa, my colleague. And you um, you rightly, I mean, you you very, uh, uh, I, I think you detailed sort of the topics and content that you really focus on, so sexuality and feminism and intersectionality. And, and I read something um, on your webpage by, that said that you all seek to be the voice for social justice in oppressive societies. So given what you are doing um, with your online magazine, what are the challenges that you face in staying online? And what do you think is at stake for queer people in the region whose access to queer related information and resources is becoming or perhaps will become increasingly limited? Thank you, Amy, for your question, and we're very glad to participate in this report with you and my fellow participants, uh, panelists. Um, well, some of the challenges that uh, a pub, um, an online publication that is queer, feminist, intersectional like ours, we face um, many issues. One of them is governmental um, you know, governmental decisions and governance over the internet. You know, uh, we are currently censored in three countries in the Middle East. Uh, and these censorships come due to certain pressures from uh, various sorts of, uh, of either conservative uh, uh, parliament members or, or, or government members who don't wish this content to be uh, very apparent in our societies. Um, unfortunately, we are censored in, these, in, in, in several of these countries, and we may be censored um, in the future, who knows, because uh, uh, guidelines towards censorship uh, in many countries are uh, changing, they're evolving rapidly, uh, specifically during the COVID where online presence have accelerated uh, these specific, um, you know, the, the, the existence of queer digital spaces. Um, another aspect is that we face is the, the new wave of existence towards um, inclusive publications that um, initially did not start as being inclusive and, and uh, they were homophobic at some sort, but because funding lies in becoming exclusive, they change all of their values to become more inclusive of LGBT people, where they suddenly start talking about LGBT issues during Pride Month or, uh, or because the funder is requesting for them to, be, to become more gender neutral or they want to be inclusive to queer voices. So these spaces do... Uh, uh, do take advantage and exploit queer voices in the name of justice, but it's camouflaged uh, under many other things. Um, other things that uh, uh, I would believe that uh, many people who are uh, queer or uh, from our community, they face many digital threats. So aside from our work as a publication, individuals, they still face digital threats, being publicly outed, uh, publicly fished by certain governments who either wants to use them to get to other groups. Um, certain governments still use um, homosexuality as a tool to denounce certain things like a revolution or to try to track down on, on, on certain political parties that they want to associate them with uh, uh, um, queer people. Um, so these are the, some of the things that many people um, uh, still, still face in our world, specifically our region, where their voices are exploited, it's used. Um, uh, yeah. I, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. No, that's that's um that, that I think that paints a a, a very um 
useful picture of what the kinds of issues are that you're contending with. And the, and the point about COVID is also really interesting. I think we, we also heard a bit about that. Um, Misha, let me turn to you. And, and I think, you know, most people in this audience likely know about the, the infamous anti-gay propaganda law that was passed in Russia in 2013, um, which has really worsened um, stigma and discrimination against queer people and specifically has limited freedom of speech, including, including online. So, you know, and this is all, of course, within an increasingly, um, uh, an increasing political repression and authoritarianism that's affecting all citizens, if, if, uh, if I can say that. So I'm wondering if you can share some specific examples of how the, how the propaganda law or related laws have impacted internet, internet freedom for queer people and how the community has tried to respond. So also sort of what lies ahead, I guess, for, for LGBTIQ activism and support in the Russian context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And um, you were absolutely right when you told that uh, in, here in Russia state use different uh, legal approaches <laughs> to ban uh, LGBTI community. Uh, and not just LGBT community, I would not, uh, I, I would say that uh, LGBT community is a part of civil society, so that is the same approaches which the uh, state uses against all people in um, Russia who would like change the situation to the more democratic uh, uh, possibilities, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, and if uh, uh, telling about different um, specific issues, it will be quite long because state use, uh, I would call that a strategy of diversity in persecution. Uh, so they use not just this, um, as you said, infamous anti-gay uh, law propaganda law, uh, but also a foreign agent law, mm -hmm. uh, pornographic, uh, against pornographic uh, uh, law and many, many others. Just, uh, I will pick up just some few of them. For example, the website of Parni Plus, which means uh, Guys Plus, that it's an um, organization what, uh, were founded in 2006, quite long ago. And 2008, uh, they were awarded by United Nations uh, Red Ribbon Award. So it's really great organization. And the same year they created website, but uh, three years ago, it was blocked. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, literally deny of family uh, values and propaganda of same-sex uh, relationship? Within a year, with the help of great attorney, they unblock mm -hmm. uh, their website. But this year, <laughs> uh, they were fined for uh, 300,000 troubles, which is about four thousand uh, dollars which for Russian reality is about nine months of average uh, salary life mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the court found some political activities in their um, everyday life is their routine and one was that they uh, that the head of the organization says, that there is a lot of uh, mistakes in making program for people with IHIV, IH, HIV status. Mm -hmm. So he, he was just frank and the state doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. And they say that is political action against the state because the state should do better. <laughs> That is the issue. Just one month ago, LGBT Center in Gutenberg uh, was uh, banned. Uh, I mean, its uh, website was banned by, but successfully, again, uh, due to the uh, um, huge work of attorney, uh, this website was unbanned. But it's not just website, as you said about social uh, profiles as well. A lot of uh, uh, social profiles of LGBT activists were blocked, especially in the Russian social network uh, of Kontakte, uh, which is, um, I would say, uh, state, uh, state is very carefully watched over this uh, network. Um, and for example, Yulia Svetkova, probably you heard about the case. 
she was uh, accused in criminal uh, pornographic law uh, due uh, her uh, profile, the vagina monologue. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it started, the case against her started in, uh, in 2019 and she's still there. Um, so a Russian LGBT network constantly faced uh, attack, uh, attacks against uh, its profiles or website. So, yeah. No, thank you. You know, um, and when we come to the next part of the discussion, it would be really interesting to hear more, Misha, about, for example, some of the arguments that were used by those lawyers, you know, how they managed to to uh, um, have the ban dropped. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's a constant battle, but um, maybe we can touch on that point in a second. Um, so Lini, I'm gonna turn to you now. Um, you know, I, th I think um, it's, it's pretty widely known that in Indonesia, you're, you're facing really growing influence of conservative religious ideologies that are, that are increasingly positioning LGBT people as sort of anti-family or immoral or, um, and, and, and yet you all have had, you as activists, I mean, LGBTQ activists have had some success in, in pushing back. So I'm wondering if you can tell us more about the evolving situation in Indonesia and how is the movement affected by the increasing censorship and how are you fighting back? Um, and, and what do you see going forward? Um, yeah, uh, well, before I start to respond to your questions, again, thank you for having me here. And thank you also for um, inviting me um, to be part of the research uh, in the last uh, two years. Um, so I remember um, these situations of the censorship evolving in Indonesia, we started in 2016. So it was when the member of the parliament um, from Islamic political party called Partai Keadilan Sejahtera um, requested the Ministry of Technology, uh, Communications and Information to ban um, queer and pornographic related websites. Um, so the ministry then instructs the panel to review the request. And then that was 2016. 2017, then the ministry with the panel, uh, with the panelists, came out with 47, uh, no, 477 of the website contain. You will, you will shock to hear this. So the 47, uh, 477 um, were the 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 website that contain first terrorism, second pornographic, and third queer. Uh, information stuff to be banned. So this um, three uh, contents. Yeah? Uh, at first, the political uh, Islamic political party only requested for the queer and pornographic related, but then the ministry comes out as well with the terrorism um, uh, campaign website. Um, the ministry then called all the internet providers and um, what it's called uh, over the top or OTP um, services like Line, Facebook, WhatsApp to take down all the 477 leads. And that time I was still part of Arus Pelangi as advocacy coordinator back then. We also received the letter from the ministry, uh, from the uh, uh, ministry. Um, and then we, we, we read the letter, we scanned the letter. Uh, and uh, we found that there there was no at all pornographic content on our website, right? So all the website was content about the um, e uh, public education on sexuality, on soji rights, basically, um, and the criminalization process in Indonesia. Uh, we then again uh, we then refused to um, to accept that letter. <laughs> because it, the minister, the ministry put down the Arslan website into um, into list of the uh, ban, and then we um, we went to commissioner, uh, we went to uh, Komnas Ham or National Human Rights Institution, um, 
uh, we do the dialogue with them. We requested them to to bridge to um, communicate with the Ministry of Communications and Information and request to them that uh, uh, to have a meeting, to have you know, to have a negotiation with them and explain to them that our website is not contain uh, pornography. Not only Islamic website, but other um, also other uh, queer organizations in Indonesia that also on in the list of the forty seven seven um, at that time. Um, the government uh, misconstrued that every queer website are uh, as uh, pornography and um, and therefore subject to law uh, to laws um, outlawing. So that. Uh, that's the um, apa, uh, the uh, the reason, yeah. So they they misconstrued that. Um, and then why censorship? Um, it's it's you know it's because the queer community characterized by the government as uh, dangerous to national security. Why they characterize uh, characterize that? And uh, that's shown when they put the queer website in the list of 40, uh, 477 together with terrorism uh, contained website. So that's when he analyzed that, hey, we, uh, we see our website uh, <laughs> listed down by the government because we seen as dangerous to uh, national security, um, as well as the threat um, to the moral fabric. And I always mention this, um, uh, in uh, every time censorship um, topics uh, discussed in, in Indonesia. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, it's correct that we don't have any national law against a queer community, but then the growing fundamentalist Islamic conservatism, if I, if I can say, the same like in Malaysia, uh, led to the situation where censorship is growing and happening in Indonesia. I will stop there first, and then we will continue later. Back to you, Amin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to hear, you know, how how um, the the those websites are the, the queer websites are being lumped together, you know, with with terrorism and 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 pornography. As uh, yeah, it's. Um, it's really unbelievable. Let me let me all ask all three of you, and actually, if you wish to even talk with among each other, among yourselves, that would be great too. But, but I guess fundamentally, um, how do activists, LGBTIQ activists, reduce the risks that they face in highly censored and digitally insecure environments? And also, how can the larger community of human rights advocates fight against these threats and support local activists? So it's about reducing the risks, and then what can others do to support local activists, um, and also uh, fight against the broader issue of of um, digital threats and censorship. Who would like to take that on first? Well, I can start. Go ahead. Who wants to go first, Mika? You want to go first, Mika? Please go ahead. No, 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 no. I just you know, all the freezing. <laughs> uh -oh. well, go, go ahead, Misha, why don't you go ahead first? Uh, oh, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the actors in Russia, we just trying to use security trainings, including digital security trainings, which uh, greatly helps. Uh, but at the same time, we just uh, touched this small issue about Google and Apple. Uh, recently uh, action uh, when uh, they decided to to remove after Kremlin piles uh, on pressure um, Navalny voting application so-called smart voting and that is uh, I would say uh, bad uh, bells ringing rings because uh, when such uh, Titan Titans as Google and Apple could not fight against such regimes, uh, like in Russia, for example, or Turkey, or Malaysia, 
uh, I would say uh, that will be very difficult for local collectivists to fight against them. Uh, and that is a part of, I think, uh, as I said, border uh, activist uh, community, especially in America, for example, to uh, put pressure on Apple office to talk about that, frankly. I absolutely understand why they use why they did it because they care about the people who works for Apple or Google in Russia. Mm -hmm. But we have to discuss this. We could not be left without any, you know, hope <laughs> in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it 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 was really horrifying to see. A, 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 I think um, Misha is referring to when Google and Apple recently just um, uh, pulled the app that um, facilitated uh, the, the voting of for, for Naval it was Navalny's uh, election app, I think. Is that right? Um, so very much part of this this broader discussion. Um, uh, Khaled, let me go back to you uh, on the same question about how activists can reduce risks and, and how can the larger community of human rights defenders and advocates um, fight against threats and support local activists in this fight? So what's interesting is that I, I totally see a repetition of how governments use each other's tools and, and mechanisms and how to use different kinds of laws uh, to, to, in the name of national security to be able to block and censor. For instance, I, um, in Jordan, they also uh, they create laws that are so vague. You, as, a, as an average reader, you don't understand what does it include when they say like uh, certain websites that uh, threat national security. Uh, and based on these kind of laws, they have to block and, and censor these voices uh, where um, uh, and in other countries, they don't only censor and uh, block it. They also, as you mentioned, they extort and they threaten and they arrest based on these uh, be based on these issues. I think one of the best tools to do is reporting these issues uh, and conducting such reports because they, these reports conducted by international organizations, they do, they, they get different translations. They reach different international audiences that do end up being um, pushed against governments or against um, uh, decision makers, and they forced and they forced uh, all sorts of changes. I think also we started to realize that using different social media in different countries, they might uh, end up simply dancing in Egypt on TikTok and get you arrested. Uh, and these things do happen. So at the same time, reporting these issues. Uh, uh, collaborating with local communities, local uh, activists, because I think one, uh, it's very difficult to create change as an individual, but as a collective, um, mm -hmm. there's power in that. Um, I think w one of the tools that we also started to realize is that Grindr, uh, for instance, have I, we understand it's blocked in many countries, but in the countries that they are available in, they, they have, um, if I believe, something called Grinder for Equality or Grinder for Change, which you which the activists can collaborate with the organization or, or the app Grinder to to dis, uh, to distribute um, messages of like if there's mass arrests, maybe a Grinder can help in in, in quickly uh, putting the, the the messages out there. Um, uh, 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 as Mikhail said, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm sorry if I am not. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, uh, also using digital, like um, updating digital security uh, methods among activists specifically, because it's, I don't think it, digital security might be linked to average uh, queer users, but maybe for activists who might be able to create these little workshops in their smaller communities will help. Um, there's also uh, international uh, international conferences, which a person or a collective can create reports and submit them to these uh, to these conferences, where you can confront your own government with these. Uh, human rights violations, uh, um, uh, violating freedom of speech in your own country, uh, create a protesting, creating digital um, protests. Uh, uh, there's many ways of conducting these, uh, creating a certain hashtag as a collective. Uh, they can all, uh, also intersectionality is very, very important. 
um, people who are queer or LGBT should not work only as LGBT and queer. It should be, uh, there should be intersectional uh, uh, ap ap application towards uh, fighting against um, uh, decision makers or authorities. You know, a, a human um, a freedom of speech is not only a queer, uh, a queer issue, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unanimous issue. So if they block queer voices, next time they're gonna block feminist voices, they're gonna block people who are uh, fighting against racism. It, it, it's, it starts from one thing and it applies to many other things. So I think intersectionality is very, very important to remove ourselves from being, to seeing each other as just us as one circle, which is an LGBT circle, we should be more inclusive and more intersectional. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you, you raised some really, that's, that's such an important point. Um, I mean, you're talking about, um, among the many things you touched on, certainly you're talking about, I think, raising visibility. When censorship is occurring, it needs to be highlighted in whatever way, whether it's conferences, reports, or other, um, you know, as you said, digital protesting. But this point about being in alliance with other movements, I think is also really crucial, um, the, the intersectional aspects of this. Um, it, it helps reduce the risk, it shares the risk across many groups instead of having one, one be the focus. So thank you. Um, Lini, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to also echo what Nisha and Khalid already shared with us um, digital security training for Spain for the queer activities, queer feminist activities. That's very, very important. And, uh, you know, of international organizations, international donors, uh, they should support um, every uh, queer organization who are in the country. Uh, High risk country, or even the uh, the contents of queer itself being banned, such as in our countries, um, and then uh, the intersectionality, of course, in solidarity with other movements is very very important. Um, I think that what uh, uh, if you ask how how um, we as a queer activist that highly um, and then how we reduce the the risk, uh, the intersectionality and the digital security is, you know, the, the very important key for us to be able to survive and to be able to uh, uh, raise a passion. Uh, for instance, um, frequent safety and security assessment, that's very important for us and we need to do that a lot, like one week, uh, um, safety and security assessment among activists need to be held uh, for uh, for the sake of our security and safety, of course. Um, serving in online space with anonymity that is also very, very uh, important. I mean, practicing the basic of um, uh, digital safety and security is very important. And to know what the basics are, we do really need to have digital security training again and again and again. Um, uh, and what the international uh, uh, can do to support local uh, activism or local activists, um, support the need of digital security uh, training, um, support the need to subscribe uh, um, in accessing uh, the tools that are secure, like VPN, for instance, because if we use free VPN, that no secure at all, right? Uh, uh, and then all the support must be formalized systematically in any funding or in any partnership or any project mechanism. Uh, yeah. Help local activities uh, or assist local organization, local community in raising state sponsor censorship uh, that, you know, pushing uh, that government uh, is holding the uh, accountability. So um, international organization, I think, uh, can play that, uh, that role. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. No, that's, that's an incredible, I think, list of, list of actions and um, recommendations. That's uh, really helpful. I wonder if, Misha or uh, Khaled, you have any response to what Lini was saying or anything you want to add if that sort of... No? Um, Khaled, no? Um, 
you know, one just quick follow-up question to, to, to each of you is, um, you know, we're talking about safety and security training and, and ability to circumvent, but um, currently, do you feel that, that in, in your respective context that activists are, have, have the ability to keep up with the technical the sort of ongoing um, need to learn how to circumvent, to access VPNs that actually work? You know that are actually safe, um, uh, and and as you pointed out, Lini, that also requires funding often to make sure that they're really secure. Um, I mean, I it's it's a I'm just curious to, to what extent is there a gap between what is what is needed to really be secure and to 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 fight against the censorship and um, and or in your context, are people able to kind of keep up with with that if you understand my question um i'm gonna um, um I'm gonna, i volunteer to start first um i i think uh in 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 many local groups or or activist group in in in, in in the various areas in the region, there has been application of uh, digital security because I think the local communities or the local activists of each com of, of, of different communities are always collaborating with digital rights organizations to make sure that they are always updating their tools because governments always update their tools and, and censorship and, and applying different ways of uh, censorship and arrests. Uh, you know, they get creative, we get creative. They want to do this, we'll find different ways of doing it. I think it's always like a Tom and Jerry type of situation with, with the government. Not always fun as it looks, but at the same time, that's the realities that we are living. Uh, but I, I, I believe, uh, yes, there are a little bit of, you know, um, also I started to realize there's a word of mouth of certain things that um, different popular pages that are queer and inclusive pages they do share this kind of this type of content constant uh, constantly on, on their pages that have um, a huge number of followings that are the, the, the that are majorly queer uh, or feminist specifically uh, another uh, another an, uh, another thing i wanted to to comment on something that you mentioned i i think in 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 many different places in our region you know specifically talking about the middle east and north africa i don't think i understand that the context of this session is about uh, uh censorship and and governance towards the internet but also the needs and the priorities of the local communities are not specifically towards censorship uh, and internet access i think it, it relies much more towards physical security and and uh, having uh, all sorts of threats that that could come from the house or from the government or the street or the, you know what i mean and i think there's a lack of physical spaces you know, I understand we're talking about digital spaces here and the security, which is very, very important. I'm part of that community. I'm part of the digital, uh, of, of security, uh, securing queer feminist digital uh, safe spaces, but also securing physical spaces, safe housing. These are also things that we need to listen because, you know, uh, uh, digital threats could lead to physical threats. So these are things that we need to not disconnect. I know it, it, we're talking about something that is very specific, but we shouldn't disconnect it also from the physical harms that could be uh, a follow-up to these uh, digital threats. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great, really, really important point. I mean, yeah, so many of our communities around the world actually aren't safe in, in life, in, in just moving around in society or in their homes even. Um, Misha, did you wanna did you wanna add anything? Any further comments? Yeah, I would like just uh, very small. Absolutely agree with Khalid. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, for your speech. But um, I would say that the perfect uh, security training, whatever digital or physical or psychological as well, because we have to keep in mind that it also embraces our psychology when we are under threats uh, and. Um, should be like a triangle and many organizations forgot about that that we have to be we have to uh, take care about the uh, theory we have to follow practice like not just tell about vpn but 
install now, use now <laughs> during the security training, because you have to have body memory how to do it. <laughs> when you when you face problem, when you face threats, it might be a little bit late <laughs> to think about. And the third, which is also very important, especially especially in countries which is not economically successful, it's tools like phones, like laptops. It's also very important. You can use the highest, the best approach of security, but you, when you have, I don't know, Nokia, the first version, that will be useless. That should be like a triangle. That's my point. Great, great reminder. Um, let me just pause here. I don't see any questions in the Q&A or the chat, but if, if the audience has questions, now would be a good time to post them. Um, and maybe I would like, while we're waiting for questions, if they come in, um, to invite Maria and Irene to join into the conversation and add any perspectives that you all would like to add to this, to this conversation so far. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to, um, unless if Irene, you'd, you'd like to go first. Okay, um, just on the on the question of uh, digital security and uh, Misha very rightly um, highlighted the need also for um, examining security more holistically, also thinking about psychological aspects. Uh, in the chat here, I've uh, just linked to the Holistic Security Guide by Tesco Tech, which tries to have this more holistic approach and uh, it, it sort of guides you through the types of questions that you can think about when thinking about security. Um, what are some of the approaches and the different elements of security which go beyond uh, specific tools that you can use? Um, and also the, the Citizen Lab um, have also done amazing work uh, with the security planner um, and have published a lot of relevant research reports. Um, so there definitely are a number of resources out there available for all of you to uh, consult. Uh, there's also the, the, self, uh, self, the self defense guide um, by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, um, I, I think what was highlighted is really important that we need to constantly have ongoing discussions and to ongo on an ongoing basis evaluate um, security within your own personal context um, as part of a broader threat modeling process. Thank you, Maria. Irene, do you want to add any thoughts on this? Uh, sure. Um, thank you to, to all the panelists. That was a very uh, fascinating discussion. And I think uh, I think I, I, I'm gonna speak on behalf of the authors. I think we all agree with, with what's been said and how, um, how it's been pointed out that uh, the role of the private sector is really necessary when it comes to um, implementing censorship. And as Khalid has pointed out earlier that you know, we suspect that countries learn from each other in terms of, you know, how they conduct censorship, what websites are censored, et cetera. Um, certainly, you know, Indonesia and Malaysia were neighbors to one another. And so I wouldn't be surprised if some sort of learning and some sort of diffusion of uh, the techniques of censorship and what are censored are, uh, are you know, is occurring from one country to another. Um, and I think, you know, listening to what Lini has said and, and also what uh, Misha said earlier about uh, the, uh, the ability of civil society to push back. I mean, I think um, just as uh, countries learn from one another, um, I think the same kind of learning, you know, I think from the course of this research we see is happening among civil society as well. Um, how LGBT rights advocate, you know, they're working with lawyers, they're working with other rights advocate, because as Misha pointed out, um, LGBT rights is human rights. It, sh it shouldn't just be an advocacy that is being done uh, just, you know, specifically by LGBT rights act activists, but it's also by everyone. Um, and so I I think um, this kind of collaboration needs to continue to happen along with researchers and, and, and academics uh, in documenting evidence-based uh, research of the censorship that's happening. And then, you know, we work together with advocates in the region uh, to, to highlight, you know, that this is a problem, that it is a violation for human rights. And so I think um, this types of collaboration need, need to happen. And so we're very grateful to, to Outright and to UNI for, um, you know, for, for coming up with the idea of 
of writing this report together. And in the future, we hope to expand, to include other countries as well and other mechanisms of censorship, right? So this report uh, covered specifically uh, website censorship, but as, as uh, it has been pointed out in the report that not all LGBT groups uh, have websites. Um, now increasingly groups have moved to social media. Uh, groups are using Facebook, for example, or, or Telegram or, or WhatsApp and other uh, platform to, to mobilize, to, to, to coordinate. And increasingly those platforms are being targeted as well. And so I think we need to continue to, to, um, uh, to do research so that we can provide the evidence that is necessary for advocates in the region to continue pushing back. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I'm not seeing um, any questions coming forward. So um, it, I'm just, if there are any last words that Misha Khalid Lini you want to offer, um, now would be a good time and then we can we can wrap up. Anything that you wanted to say that we, we didn't touch on at this point? No, I think um, what Irene mentioned at, uh, at the end was very, very, um, the cherry on top, basically, um, mentioning how many LGBT activist groups or LGBT groups in general might not have um, might not have websites. Even sometimes so, um, uh, did um, uh, social media, or they're very they're very minimum. Uh, there's very minimum usage of them. Uh, due to the high risks of, of living in certain countries, but they're very there's they they really highly depend on words of mouth and words of recommendation from from the from local communities and in recommending of uh, how to communicate better or finding different ways of communication. Um, it's it was a very interesting. I know it's it's simple, but it's very I think it's very important to highlight the fact that many of these groups don't utilize online spaces with the high uh, push towards using online spaces um, comes higher risks. So uh, I think we're back uh, peddling towards uh, primitive ways of communicating when it comes to, uh, for us being a, a queer activists or individuals in, in, the, in, in different countries. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a form of self-censorship. And if you're having to really backpedal and find other ways, and as, as opposed to really taking advantage of the technology that exists. Um, so, Misha Orlini, any final words? No? Uh, just thank yeah, you. I and let's, let's go on, on yeah, monitoring go and creating these uh, programs and pushing donors, pushing civil society, in our countries, because it's very important also to have such uh, such uh, webinars for our LGBTI communities, not just uh, uh, American LGBT community, uh, to discuss, to see, and what do you what you said to learn from each other how we can do our job. No, it's a great great point, Lini. Last last word to you. Yeah, I think I think I I uh, I do really agree on political activity, um, that all activities, not only queer activities, must be, you know, uh, well informed with the holistic uh, security, because digital security related to physical security, and it's related to uh, psychological as well. So um, we, uh, MU, <laughs> Me and then only from international um, organizations. I think this uh, kind of uh, idea um, of holistic security must be, you know, spread all over the activism world. And um, I want, I, I want to also um, point it on the self censorship. Unfortunately, in the environment like Indonesia, where silencing the Voice of the activism, not only queer activism, but also democracy um, and human rights. Uh, self censorship can be very, uh, it, it's actually very tricky, very tough on us, really. Um, you know, it's part of the compromise with the environment, um, hostile environment. We do, we do not want to compromise the state censorship and state silencing the voice of the active, uh, activists. But then again, we need to also keep continued work of the advocacy and activism so that 
part of you know self self censorship must be taken into consideration. So I hope this dilemma um, can be understood. Thank yeah. you, Benjamin. Thank you, Lini, for that for that great point. We've come to the end. I want to really express my sincere gratitude to each of you, uh, uh, Khalid, Misha, Lini, Irene, Maria, all for being part of this discussion. Um, thank you. It will be uh, posted on our website. Um, and also for those of you in the audience who want to check out the report, um, I think it's posted on, on both UNI, well, UNI Citizen Lab and Outright's um, websites. So uh, you, can, you can check it up there. Um, thank you again so much for this really rich discussion. And we really appreciate your, your being willing to talk with us about this. All right, I think that's it then. Signing off. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Uni. Thank you, Otra. Bye. Bye, thank you.